Welcome to Italy for the second round of the Blanc Pain GT World Challenge Europe on the Adriatic coast at the Misano World Circuit. Some would want to be on the beach, we want to be watching the racing action at the track. It was a clean start for the second race at Brands Hatch. Nico Bastian led the way. It was very tight in behind. In the midfield, four abreast, but it was down at the tail of the field where Marcus Finkelhock was given a squeeze. And uh, as the cars came back across the track, you can see damage there. Tom Gamble limping around. All action opening lap. But the really big moment came up at Hawthorne's. David Perel diving up the inside of Fred Vavish, spinning the Audi around. And unfortunately, Vavish went back across to the other side of the circuit, taking three or four other runners out with him at the edge of the circuit. Front though ball was clean, looking very good for Nico Bastian as they ran towards the pit stops. Already starting to hit trouble though was the 88 Acker ASP Mercedes and that wasn't to be the end of its woes. Very tight in the pit lane, jockeying for position out front. Mauro Angle had done a brilliant opening stint and Lucas Stoltz was totally in control for Black Falcon, pacing it clear and uh, really had no rivals in the second half of the race and all the battling was in behind. Aurovenio had this moment in the R Motorsport Aston Martin and then distraught Vance and Avril, the problem for 88, became terminal. And then the sister car, Timo Bogoslavski now at the wheel, clearly in trouble of its own. Looking for trouble, perhaps Ricky Collard fighting with Kelvin van der Linde. And the Aston Martin kept on prevailing, but van der Linde was not to be denied. Up the inside he went in his Audi, great racing. And for Bogoslavski, I'm afraid, that proved terminal. The spoke led to stop, but it was victory for Lucas Stoltz, so no wonder Mauro Engels so delighted to greet him. A second place and a first place, what fantastic haul at Brands Hatch. So the largest check of all to Mauro Engel and Lucas Stoltz, presented by series founder Stefan Rattel. New for 2019, the Blanc Pan GT World Challenge with the championship in the States, in Europe and in Asia. The manufacturers nominate four drivers for each of those series. Let's take a look at Ferrari's runners for the American series. And in Europe, Ferrari's representatives, here they are. And in Asia, here are the quartet. And let's take a look at the dozen drivers all looking for glory around the globe, the prancing horse. And likewise, Mercedes nominated four drivers for each of the series. Here are the runners in the American series. In Blanc Pan GT World Challenge Europe, here are the magical quartet. And the four drivers racing for Mercedes in the Asian series. And at this early stage in the championship, let's take a look at the points tallies. And it's uh, Mercedes going very well on 6,109 points, almost 2,000 points more than Ferrari. But things can change, and they may well do that here at Mizano. Coming into the 2019 series, a look down the entry list and the Black Falcon Mercedes team stood out as a likely front-running combination. Mauro Engel and Lucas Stoltz went really, really well at Brands Hatch, starting from pole position. And they're sure to be strong on whichever circuit they go racing. Overall, we are uh, 6.5 points behind. So we definitely try to make up some points here. Uh, in the Sprint Challenge or in the World Challenge, uh, we are still leading by 11 points, uh, which we're really happy about it. But uh, yeah, we're facing a really hot and really difficult weekend because we came straight from the Nürburgring. It was really exhausting for the team, so really credits to them that they, that they really push and uh, stay focused. It's not an easy weekend for us, but yeah, we're definitely here to win. Racing for glory on home ground is Andrea Fontana, Audi Sport Italia, entering an R8 LMS. For Andrea to share with the ultra-experienced Audi racer, Pierre Kaffer. Yeah, I'm very happy to, to join Blanc Pain GT Series. Uh, it's my first time here, so it will be really nice to see uh, how we will be inside this the championship. The level here is really high. I know Misano really good. Uh, I raced a few times here. It's the first time with Audi, so we need a few laps to get the feeling and then uh, let's see what happens. It's not only the first drivers to the finish who take honours in any of the Blanc Pan GT World Challenge rounds because there's Pro-Am and Am classes as well. And going very well this year in Pro-Am is Louis Machiel sharing with the ultra-experienced Andrea Bertolini. The opening rounds at Brands Hatch didn't turn out to be a dream result, but hopefully all will be right here at Misano. For me, it's a very honour to drive a Ferrari. It's, of course, it's already a couple of years that I'm doing uh, this kind of uh, issues, uh, races. Last, uh, weekend, uh, I mean Brands Hatch, we had the pole, so unfortunately I make the small mistake, but we are here now in Misano to take revenge. Another Italian driver looking to shine on home soil is second generation racer Mattia Drudi, sharing with Milan Donch, another young talent. They're competing in the Silver Cup class for Attempto Racing, 
and uh, certainly looking for a really, really strong run around the tight twists of Misano. For sure the tyre degradation will be the key for this weekend. You know, racing when outside is 40 degrees means that the asphalt temperature will be around 55, 56, so it's really tough for both the drivers and the cars. It's a really nice feeling to race here in Misano. It's my home track and living just 500 meters away from the track. So, and having all the fans and all of my families around the earth for sure will help me even more. Certainly a championship favorite coming into 2019. Raffaele Marcello had high hopes, but Franz Hatch was a fourth place in a retirement, so plenty to fight for. And for this weekend, maybe a change of luck as the cars changed from blue to red. Yeah, in endurance, I did only Monza. I drove uh, two hours. In uh, Silverstone, I didn't jump in the car. For Ricardo, I didn't jump in the car, so yeah, didn't drive so much this year with all the problems we had, but I mean, in sprint, in the, in the GT World Challenge, we did only one round. I mean, it's still, it's still quite everything open. We try to start from, uh, from this race to, to start to recover a bit of points, and I mean, for the overall and endurance spice is the main where you get out of point, and for sprint it's only one round, so it's still, it's still, it's still pretty open everything. There's a new challenger on the block for this year, Thomas Neubauer, very, very fast young racer for Aka ASP. He's sharing with Nico Bastian and they took victory at Brands Hatch. Can they do it here as well? Switching from single seater to uh, GT cars is uh, a big step, but having Nico with me is a big, uh, big advantage. Like, uh, he can teach me all his uh, experience and, and stuff. Obviously, this weekend, the main goal is still the Silver Cup. But after the last weekend in, uh, in Brunsach, we hope for another overall podium. So that's the main goal. FFF Racing Team is running a trio of Lamborghinis this year, and one of the stars is Marco Mapelli. He's sharing with Andrea Caldarelli, sure to go well here on home ground in Italy. Well, racing in Italy is always very emotional. Uh, it's a home race for the team because most of the guy lives near Sant'Agata in Bologna and uh, that's uh, obviously will make us proud if we get a good result. We have to think at 360 degrees so we have to be careful and attack at the same time which is not easy sometimes because obviously you want to win every race but for sure we have to look for the championship, looking for a big picture and concentrate on everything we do. A wonderful, hot, sunny evening at Misano. Fortunately, cooler than it was earlier in the day. We're all set for the first of our two races here at Misano, but a packed grid of cars, 28 runners here this weekend, filling this tight and twisty track. And it's Charles Vietz, 18 years old, on pole for his family team, for Team WRT. An astonishingly good job. And an Aston Martin alongside. We're gonna glide down the grid. Andrea Caldarelli will start third in his Lamborghini, Christian Engelhardt in the rival Grasser racing Lamborghini on the other side of the second row of the grid. Looking for a change of luck, the red has replaced the blue as the livery for the number 88 Acker ASP Mercedes. And Vincent Abril will start from fifth and Luca Stoltz sharing, he's the championship leader for Black Falcon, will start alongside for Black Falcon. Nico Bastian won that opening race at Brands Hatch with Thomas Neubauer and alongside Simon Gachet, the Sanslot Racing Audi is getting better and better through this weekend. There's the second one, Stephen Palette. Timo Bogoslavski, another good runner, very strong runner for Acker ASP. Rick Broikers for Audi and alongside Sister Car. Very, we're only halfway down the grid and we've had some fantastic names, John, and really today it was so quick firing qualifying. Yes, it was a very competitive qualifying on a, a tight racetrack, 16 turns, but nevertheless it's a uh, a circuit that demands a great deal of focus and concentration, especially in these very, very hot conditions. Some of the parts of the track have not been offering up the level of grip that drivers had maybe anticipated. Probably we may see a little of that once this race gets underway. Inevitably on the opening lap, it'll be a traffic jam into turns one, two and three. But hopefully, hopefully, keep saying it, please guys, think about the race distance. It's not one lap, it's one hour. Well, perfect timing, just got down to the last car on the grid, or penultimate car, new this weekend, get speed performance, uh, Mercedes, welcome to the Blanc Pan GT World Challenge. And another factor that just cannot be ignored this weekend, it's been very hot, track temperature is down a, a huge amount, it was down it's 16 degrees, we saw nearly 49 degrees track temperature today, the air temperature thankfully as we are in the evening now, it's uh, quarter, coming up to quarter to eight. The sun is dropping lower, it's getting cooler, but keeping tire-like has been absolutely the hardest thing this weekend. It's a formation lap, 
nearly at a conclusion. The sun low in the drivers' faces as they come up towards the final corner, turn 16. Of course, they have to turn to the left. Look to the lights on the starting gantry. There should be two sets of red lights. There they are in the middle. When we have the bulk of the field round the final corner, they will be turned to green. It looks a tidy start, two by two, exactly as we want it. And pole man Charles Vitz has assumed the lead. Ricky Collard trying to tuck in behind in the Aston Martin. But around the outside, Andrea Cordarelli, he wanted a good start. He's got a magnificent start up into second position. Ricky Collard looks like he'd done enough. And Mauro Engel making a big, big charge in the Black Falcon Mercedes. Good tidy running through the first yeah, good corners. execution by Calderelli. He knew that he knows the circuit obviously very well. He knew there's a chance because everybody tends to sort of bunch up in the first part of turn one. They all get slowed down. So if you've got a, a clear exit in turn one, you can take the long way around. Calderelli executed that overtake with extreme skill. So well done all and Zundry 28 now putting slightly out to protect the inside line into turn eight so he'll lose a bit of ground there but hold on to third position is Ricky Collard. The first two have made their break. Charles Veerts only 18 years old. Astonishingly mature drive to take pole and now he's got to show all his maturity to try and resist Calderelli. And I'm just watching Ricky Collard in the R Motorsport Aston Martin almost reverting back to single seater tactics from the earlier career path that he followed to keep the four, number four black Falcon Mercedes. Of course, he's got the, uh, uh, Christian Engelhardt in the 63 Lamborghini breathing down the back. But these two, the lead two cars, making sort of a mini break, you might say, before they've even come up to the conclusion of the first flying lap. So Charles Fetz and the Audi, and then they've got you know, Andrea Calderelli in the Lamborghini. Experience plays more to Calderelli. Again, you see the pressure Calderelli's building, particularly in this third sector of the lap at Mazzano and it's once you get onto pit straight, the difference in straight line performance between the Audi and the Lamborghini is almost negated because they have fundamentally the same engine and uh, gear train. But Calderini really closing down, putting pressure every part of the racetrack on the young Belgian driver. We have a spinner coming out of the final corner, a puff of dust past our window. We know it's not the first two because we can still see looking through the windscreen. Oh, oh. That's a, 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 a respect re ASP. As he kept going, it was number 87, that would be Mauro Ricci. So he started down towards the tail of the grid on the penultimate row and, uh, well, he hasn't lost too many positions, lost a lot of time. But Charles Beards, if he can be unsettled, this is the chance for Andrea Cordarelli. So he's not letting him relax anywhere, every single corner. He is pretty much taking a look for once. As I say that, of course, he was quite tame down into turn eight. But it's at the second, it's the third sector third of the lap, sector. down to turn 14, where he tries to chivy him and you can see Charles Beards getting very twitchy in the number two Audi. Still leading, however, still only 18 about, years old. Astonishing. Yeah, I was going to say, he's only 18 years old. He's got a much more mature driver behind Andrea Calderelli, who's familiar with GT3 racing over many seasons, particularly in Lamborghinis. But again, what Beards is doing is using all the benefits his car has got by being in the lead. So you can slow down in the, just on the apex to really frustrate the car that's chasing you till you get this kind of seesaw effect. It's a very effective way of controlling your lead. It really is, but we have to remember that this is the first season for Charles in out of Formula 4, junior single-seater racing. He did a Nations Cup in Bahrain at the end of last year, and now we will watch. It'll be a masterclass of attempted overtaking, and it only becomes a real masterclass if Andrea Cordarelli can move through into the lead. Hasn't managed it yet. Just looking down to see who's dominating in the Pro-Am class. It's Neil Stephen Art, who's down in, 20, in 16th position. The top in Am is down in 21st. So there, oh gosh, as soon as I look at the time, he's screen, trying to force the, the situation. Now he's got just a fight alongside, but he's on the wrong part of the racetrack. Now he's going to make the undercut, gets alongside, virtually now alongside, to take that position away finally from Charles Verge. That is what experience gives you. The Verge can go the long way around if he feels he's got the speed. But if I was in Calderetti's position, I would just let my Lamborghini drift out, drift out, force Vets to get out of the throttle, otherwise he's going to run off track. That's well, what experience gives you, and it was very well executed by Calderetti. Well, Let's look again. Here's how the pass got finally done, and that's what you're going to be. You're going to be that right, fair and square alongside the car you're going to pass, and then you use that advantage and you force the other car, in this case the Audi, wider and wider, forcing Vets to get out of the throttle, to check up, and that then consolidates the, the, the overtake. But right now, with a gap of uh, 0.4 of a second, just starting to eke his way clear, half a second added on that lap, nearly an entire second for the race lead. Now, this race is going to have a stop between 25 and 35 minutes. Remember, WRT have been kind of king of the pit stop castle over many, many seasons. I know that this team, this newly formed Audi team, 
Orange One FFF Racing Team to give us full title. Oh, and Tommy Fitzpatrick was that? Well, it's Mirko Bortolossi. No, Christian uh, Engelhardt. Yeah. It's obviously been contact. Is that was one of the Sanslot Racing Audis, I think, is round. It's the blue one. That's number 25. That's and Simon Gachet. And the edge of the turn three. Smoke coming off the right rear now of the Lamborghini. So bodywork rubbing. And I suspect that Christian Engelhardt's going to make a pit stop because he will not be able to continue. Otherwise, he'll cut that tire down. Well, you so, can see the point of contact. Clearly, the car yeah. from behind has come up and hit his rear as he turned into turn three. Round it went. The rest of the field was scattered behind. There is the moment. Turn three down, yeah. down to turn four. And then he flipped the right rear. Yeah. And of course, that involved the, the other... And both of the Santalot cars involved. But the driver who did the uh, assault, car number 25, Simon Gachet, into the pit lane. Don't forget, he was running sick. They made a good start. In fact, Simon started back in eighth position. So progress had been made, but it's all been undone. Well, it, it got that little bit of contact into turn four, set off a chain reaction which took out other cars. So they're now trying to catch up, having lost position. Uh, of course, they're quicker than the cars that are pursuing. But is that a pass that we just catch the pass? Uh, the yeah, Mercedes well, through? indeed, the Mercedes is through. Lucas Stoltz was biding his time. I was about to say the two words going around in Lucas' minds are, key, uh, are basically saving tyres. And he seems to have done it, but he found the chink in Ricky Collard's armoury. Look at this. Almost three wide coming into the final turn. And a battle going on further down the field. And it's getting very, very tetchy. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cars. Almost all coming back to the proverbial handkerchief. And it's the Mercedes of that group of cars that looks to have the pace. But where can he use that pace? Where can he exercise, release the speed that it has got? Maybe up into turn four. If he thinks about it, it's too short a distance to throw it down the inside. This is the replay of Third, fourth, becoming third for Lucas Stoltz. Talk yeah, because just simply that Lucas Stoltz had more drive coming onto the back straight. 1.5 seconds comes 2.3. Spot on, John. Yeah. But uh, Charles Veer still has an advantage of four seconds over Lucas Stoltz. But I reckon Stoltz had the pace of any of the drivers. Someone's gone very wide out of turn 16. Happens about every second lap in front of our commentary position. Place changes further downfield. Number 10, Rick Broikers, trying to get in the thick of the action. He's running the Silver Cup class for the younger drivers. Timo Bogoslajski in the blue Mercedes in the background, blue white Mercedes, also wants a bit of the action. Watch up, he's been, he finds himself been out positioned. He's on the outside as they go into turn four, and he's got to try and just about keep the Audi directly behind. Almost gets into contact with the 10. 10 runs very wide, that's an easy pass. So he's got to give that one up. We've got a spinner, a okay, spinner down at the bottom end of the circuit. One or two cars, we cannot see. A Charles Vance has gone round. We saw what has he done? Has second he had place, I just said he had a four second advantage over Lucas Stoltz. Luca would have caught him, but there, I'm afraid, racing on his own and well, round he's gone. I mean, the only thing I can think of, is maybe he's picked up something on the track, he may have had a deflating tyre, but that has been the boogie corner here all weekend, and particularly in qualifying, we saw innumerable drivers getting very, very wide. And if you get that by then, you will probably lose the back of the car. Well, so there is the race leader. He loses it, really. It's just the back end started. That pendulum effect began, and there was very little he was going to be able to do to, to stop the car ending up, as it, you see there, buried into the gravel. And that's the reason why we've now got a full course yellow to enable the corner workers and the snatch vehicle to lift that car out. And that's a, there's, there's Dad. I mean, he was probably enthralled in his son's progress. Now he'll be not upset or disappointed, but that's motor racing. Let's take a look at the replay of the start. It was about the tidiest start I have ever seen in a Blanc Pan GT World Challenge race, running two by two, just like the doctor ordered, all down to the first corner. We held our breath, John, but uh, from pole position, Charles Vierts did what he needed to do. Brilliant start from Cordarelli. Went one way, went the other, round the Aston Martin, up into second position, star move of the race. So let's just run down the order while we've got full course yellow. Andrea Caldarelli leading in his 563 FFF Racing Team Lamborghini from the Black Falcon Mercedes number four. Lucas Stoltz, Ricky Collard, you can see him in the Aston Martin there in third place overall. So safety car is about to come in. Caldarelli backs them up now. He's going to give it one through 15, 16. He's actually up to turn 16 too. Maybe he could have gone a little bit earlier. Well, a few drivers kicking up dust in the background. It looks like the job has been done, but we knew Vance on Abril will attack up to turn one. He had a look, not a serious look, but he's just trying to unseat Ricky Collard. But we've seen in the early stages of the race, the Aston Martin racer so may not look tough out of the car, but when he gets in, very, very uncompromising. We saw it at the oh, but that. he's made his own mistake, but somehow just gets back onto the track in front of Vance on Abril. Vance on the outside. This could be a chance for Stephen Palette behind to gain a position in the Audi. Will he manage it? 
Not quite. And not the inside of the Ali yeah. goes in and early the first of the pit stoppers, we believe. Now that, I don't know whether it was a late call or an opportunistic call, get in with the pit lane is empty. Make right. your pit stop, driver change, get back out. By the time you get back out, there will be others, and there they are. The tail of the field has basically followed through. Well, and don't, don't forget, Calderelli came in. It wasn't, didn't come on our screens very quickly. Out as we were looking at that battle for third, fourth places. 76, Aston Martin also into the pit lane, but I think that was a really good uh, call, a very late call from Stephen Pellet. He was blocked up, blocked by the cars in front of him. Let's find out, is it working or is it not? At least half the field in the pit lane now. And it's a very congested pit lane, so there's the Grasso Racing Lamborghini making its way down. Well, that's actually Mapelli getting going. He, his garage is near pit entry. Okay. He very nearly collected the back of one of the Aston Martins. I presume that's Aurovenio's okay, car. And then talk about I'm busy saying. in the pit lane. Two, three abreast, not sure that's... But the Audi has gained a position on the Aston Martin there. I mean, the way that you release cars... At the end of the pit lane, you've got this dog leg to get into the pit lane exit itself. So it is two cars coming down side by side. One on the inside, leaving his you know, pit box. The other, who's going to give ground, who's going to concede? Yeah, well, the 26 Audi, started by Steve Pellet, Marcus Winklehock, wise head on all shoulders, or is it the other way around? But he's got ahead of the Aston Martin, so Ricky Collard handed over the car to Marvin Kirchhoff, has started second, was running third, has lost out in the pit stop. What I want to see is how good a lap or number of laps we're going to get from Lucas Stoltz. He stayed out. And there's the 88 Mercedes. So Vanzano Brill gets out. Marco Mapelli now at the wheel of the car that led the race. Andrea Calderelli, of course, we're waiting to see where will Maro Engel be when he comes out, having taken over the black Falcon Mercedes. That is continuing, still in the hands of uh, Lucas Stoltz. But there we are, there's the Mercedes coming down the exit, pit lane exit, but the, what was the leading Lamborghini is probably now already into turn one. So it will still, in effect, when this washes through, as we see the Mercedes, there's the Lamborghini going through. Now we've got the Mercedes, Raffaele Marcello. It's going to be interesting, two Italian drivers and totally different brands. Who can actually dominate for the remaining 31 or so minutes yeah. of this event? Drive through penalty though for car 25 Santa causing a collision. Santa. That was Simon Gachet, Santalot Racing. We saw him hit, unfortunately, and spin Christian Engelhardt around. And anyhow, he has retired from the race, so he won't be serving that drive through penalty. Well, up into these final turns, into turn 16. Well, that pass, good pass by Boca Bordelotti. Yeah, place changes galore in these, uh, these laps after pit stop. Still waiting for Nico Bastian to come in and serve his stop. The 89 Aka ASB Mercedes. One win on the board. Oh, wow. Almost a car off the circuit there. That's Shea Davis uh, feeling a bit of muscle. Presumably that's uh, the number 11. That's Fred Verveesh. Now Thomas Neubauer under huge pressure from Mar Marcus Finkelhock there. Oh, dear. Running very, very wide. The number 90 Fabian Schiller driven car. And place lost. Marvin Kirchhofer maybe helped him into that situation. Put him forced him to go wide and, of course, carried the momentum through. And yeah, no, the no, wheels come off. Is that the 26? That's Marcus Winkelhock's car, but he's caught... No, no, that's that's the, the car in the background is already... That's the number two, but oh, Winkelhock oh. has lost a wheel. There you can see. Yeah, there it went. So, so all of a sudden, that, that battle with Neubach, it's all over. Another battle's evolving, coming down in turn one. Yeah, that's Kelvin van der Linde. He never says no to an overtaking opportunity, so Attempto Racing gained two positions without realising about the first one too much, because obviously that was uh, with the demise of Marcus Winkelhock and really making moves up the order. Nick Foster, the Australian racer in the 55 Attempto Racing car, very nice, tidy work, and he's got company behind. He's got Oscar Tunjo in there as well. It's Audi Central. That it certainly is, and that was a good move. Just, again, you have to read what's going on ahead of you and maybe you're not going to make the pass in one corner you work forward maybe for two or three corners down the racetrack Marcus Vingelhoff walks away well let's take a look at how it happened why it happened well, well. left rear pops off whether the nut or whether the wheel maybe the wheel hadn't been fully lodged onto the drive pegs whether the nut maybe hadn't been fully locked up so the message on screen now safety car in at the end of this lap there we are Raffaele Marcello right on to the gearbox coming through turn 15, the safety car is going to pull off. There it goes into the pit lane entrance. Now it's time to Mapelli to get on it, and Raffaele Marcello is going to get on it, as is Mauro Engel getting on it. I think Mauro Engel was on it more than the first two. He's closed right on the tail of Marcello. That's why they lead the championship. Nice and tidy in behind it, but the gold Lamborghini going one way, everyone trying to go around the other side. Neubauer's got through. Looks so like he's lost a position. Aston Martin has gained a position. No, he hasn't, sorry. 
he's still staying in fourth place. But yes, they both dropped Neubauer. I was correct. So well, remember, they've been under safety car or full course yellow for some time. Tire temperatures will have dropped away. Track ambient temperature they're falling away as well. So maybe Marco Mappelli was being a little bit cautious. Certainly, Raffaele Marcello is not. Getting very, very busy. Kelvin van der Linde just riding on board with him, trying to go one way, then the other to get round Fred Verbis. A lot of wheel movement from Kelvin van der Linde. You can see how hard he's working. I mean, basically, his front tyres, his rear tyres have shown their best. And he's still dragging the thing round right to the scrub of the net. Up front, the gap has now 1.01 seconds between Mappelli leading the race and Marcello in second. Has he done enough? And finally, has Kelvin van der Linde done enough to go in front? to move up to be the, the leading Audi in the race. He has, and then running very, very wide. It looks like it's going to be two, possibly even three places lost by Fred Vervish, because Nick Foster has gone through. Both the Tempto racing Audis have gone through. And in behind, Matai Drudy pushing very hard as well. Up the inside of Fred Vervish, rubbing, pushing wide. Someone's just dived into the pits. I can't tell you who it is. I can, it's Thomas Neubauer, the 89 Mercedes, was up uh, around about sixth position. He has tumbled back, he's lost. He was the fourth on the restart, but uh, it all went horribly wrong. He's dropped down the order, had another pit stop. One hour has come to its conclusion, now just waiting for this final lap to be finished. The sun still caught at certain parts of the circuit, give it ten more minutes. So as the sun sets on this Saturday, it's the first win of the season for Lamborghini in the Blanc Pan GT World Challenge Europe. It was tight, but the job was done. So relief, the first win at this level for the FFF racing team and look and uh, looking for the silver winner, Fabian Schiller in fifth place overall. The top car in the Pro-Am class, not in this Audi group, but the next car to the finish, it'll be Andrea Bertolini. There he is, the 52 Ferrari. So, so delight from the Lamborghini crew down there. And for FFF racing team, taking a lot of regular Lamborghini employees and uh, really made it work very, very well indeed. Victory today. Got to try and do it all over again tomorrow when the grid is a totally different uh, reshuffled beast. But uh, for the drivers who did the second leg, they'll be hot, but they'll be happy if their name is Marco Mappelli. And he and Andrea Cordarelli joined by John Watson. And Andrea, Andrea, many congratulations, many would say an overdue victory. Yeah, absolutely. We were waiting since, <laughs> what, five weekends? We're almost there, like we were always very close, but uh, to win in uh, our our own race, it's it's fantastic. I think we, all of us, we all deserve it. Absolutely. Now, to me, you won this race, 300 yards after the start into turn one. You went round the outside, got position, and then you were really in the right driving seat. I, I had like a weird feeling before the start. I said I had to take, uh, I had to overtake turn one, and I went. I it worked, and uh, after that, the car was was mega and. Uh, I mean, we were a bit afraid after the safety car, but uh, after that, easy job for him. <laughs> Marco, it wasn't that easy. You were under pressure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but most of the work job has been done by Andrea and the team. We knew that uh, we were struggling a little bit with the very hot in qualifying, but when it's cooling down, our car was getting better. So I just had to do my job. Sweet. So let's take a look at the results. First victory for the Orange One FFF racing team. Lamborghini crew of Andrea Cordarelli, brilliant start from him, and Marco Mappelli, who brought it home. For Vanson, Abril and Raffaele Marcello in their Acker ASP Mercedes. It is a first decent chunk of points. Luca Stoltz and Mauro Engel, as we heard, their third podium finish in the Black Falcon Mercedes in three starts, really strong. Aston Martin will be played, the R Motorsport team, Ricky Collard and Marvin Kirchhofer up to fourth place. As the trophies are presented to the top three crews, and I'm gathering that uh, the results up and down the field may not all be final, still various incidents under investigation. But I think at the front end of the field, we have no concerns. I think we know our winning order in what was a very clean race, some fantastic driving. It was close and it was almost invariably fair. And I think we've got some young drivers really starting to make their mark on the championship, most notably Charles Beertz, who ran in second place until he just got a little bit too enthusiastic and spun off. So the sound rises, the volume rises as the winning team, the Lamborghini team, FFF racing team, take victory here in the first of two races at Misano. But now, of course, the champagne and I'm sure those fancying victory don't mind if their overalls get a little bit hot, wet and smelly. They probably were already. Just don't forget, it's been a very, very hot few days here at Misano.
The grid, a very, very busy place, a very hot place ahead of the second of the two Blancpain GT World Challenge races here this weekend at the Misano World Circuit. 28 cars lined up in 14 pairs as they come up out of turn 15, the penultimate corner, looking to the final corner. Bright blue skies, hugely high temperatures here at Misano. Maybe that breeze will help them. Let's look at the starting gantry. The lights are all red as they should be. They go. It's an early drop to green. The last part runners in the field, not coming around the final corner, but Raffaele Marcello, brilliant start from Paul. It looks so uh, Christopher Hasser is trying to follow through, but no, Dries van Tor did just enough. Two, three abreast down towards the tail of the field. They kept it tidy. And Fabian, oh, we've got uh, the, the Phoenix Audi off, but a good job there by Fabian Schiller. Got a, really muscled around, looking at the tail of his car in great detail, but he managed to hold off that position. But place gained by Mirko Bortolotti. Mirko was pumped. They were probably not happy that the rival Lamborghini team won last night. And uh, he's going to try and redress that situation. Marco Mappelli, who started on the third row of the grid, is still back in effect in that position that he started in. Well, he's trying to regain his position, and that's, I think, on the tail of the 87, the Pro-Am Jim Pla-driven Mercedes that made a fantastic start. Yes, 87, get to, getting to see that really, really close up. So a few people gaining positions, but most notably, Raffaele Marcello, a brilliant start from pole position. Did what he needed to do, and in behind, around about 10th place. It's like yesterday evening, it's Absolutely. the Audis door-to-door. -door. It's a traffic jam of Audis all the way around. Turns 9, 10, now you can see the three abreast coming down. This dog leg straight to the Mercedes in the background, already on the grass, kicking up dust. And it's down at this part of the track yesterday, where we saw most of the trouble arising going into turn 13, getting caught out on the outside, spinning around. That's where Ch Charles Vertz lost the lead of the race, and that put that number two Audi out completely. And that wasn't just any Mercedes, that's the championship leading Mercedes, Amaro Engel, started on the sixth row of the grid, so dreadful qualifying. This is the car that consistently is on the podium. He doesn't want to take too many risks. He's got to stay cool, stay calm. Everyone's got to stay cool. So at the end of the opening lap, Raffaele Marcello looks like about half a second advantage over Dries Van Tor, Christopher Haas, the first three cars on the starting grid. 0.456 of a second is first to second. Great gains from Mirko Bortolotti from fourth up to fifth, but importantly, putting his, some of his rivals behind him. Dive down the inside, and that's a squeeze up the inside, and it's contact, and that will probably be seen the 26. Marcus Winkelhock tried to shut the door. The Mercedes kept coming, coming, coming. Jimmy Bla ended up having contact, and he may well have to make a pit stop as a consequence, or certainly a drive-through. Well, he certainly came from a long way back. Jim Pla fired up by going from 10th to 8th on the opening lap of the race, trying to gain another position. But Marcus Winkelhock losing out there, being the assaulted. But Dries Van Tor trying to go the long way around. Raffaele Marcello is on the outside line. That really is a long way around. Through the kinks on the he's, back track. He's got his nose in front, but he's not got enough track left. And he's followed off the track by Chris Fahas. So back into the lead goes Raffaele Marcello. That was a signal of intent. I mean, absolutely. Dries Van Tor was on the outside for three corners. Now, that's not something I would imagine anybody could do. And Christopher Hasser, likewise, is giving Dries Van Tor a big area. Again, watching the attempt to... Is that the sister car just directly in view? <laughs> Getting as close as you want to get with your sister car. So the battle there is the lead car. I thought the lead car, that's a little bit further back. The lead car has already gone through the picture. Side by side, Black Fulton is potentially going to lose a position. Coming down on that, something the, the 66 has made a strong pass. Kelvin van der Linde, good pass. This is intent from Mapelli. He's going to be shoveled to the outside, literally there, yeah, turn 15. I mean, I mean, he quicker through 14, but on the wrong part of the racetrack at 15. Had to back out of it, understandably. Then you can do a little bit of preparation, much more economic on the exit of turn 16 than the Mercedes was. Well, to penalty to car 87. Well, we're looking at 87. We're hearing news. 26 in turn That's 8. Cool. We saw the crime. Number 8 to 26 being spun round by Jim Plot, who came very late down the inside into the left-hand hairpin, spun Marcus Winkelhock round. And I'm afraid our Pro-Am leader will no longer be the Pro-Am leader. That honour will go to the driver in 16th place at the moment to the 519 Lamborghini. Phil Keane sharing with Hiroshi Hamaguchi. He's in the lead of the class, but David Perel is a tenth of a second down. Let's take a look at the replay of the incident. I mean, it, it was a big dive down the inside, down the inside, down the inside. And, uh, well... It was a judge that Jimmy Platt was the guilty party. Marcus Winkelhock didn't provide any extra room. Bit of battling between a couple of the attempted cars by Luke Cizo. It's the number 56 car. That's the one with uh, Mattia Drudy on board. He's in ninth place. The Aston Martin, haven't seen so much of that, but Hugo de Sadalia just up ahead of that grouping. But this is getting tight. And now what we're seeing is, is Maro Engel in the Black Falcon Mercedes, number four, trying to pick up positions, but he's still down in 12th. He started 11th, got shoveled on the grass on the opening lap. 
I expected come what may because he and Lucas Stoltz have been just on it in every session. Absolutely. He'd be working his way forward. But he's got a big problem, and that problem is Kelvin van der Linde, but he's gone the long way around the South African, but he's not going to make it stick because Kelvin van der Linde is holding the station side by side into turn 13. Mercedes forced wide, needs to be careful, but he doesn't let the Audi directly behind then find that way through as well. Van Chega in the 5-5-5. Let's look at them running out wide, wide, wide and beyond. Most notably, Nick Foster, two wheels off the ground, if not four. Almost taking off Kelvin van der Linde, who wants to get through these two cars. He wants to make progress because he knows he's got Marrow Engel. He gets him broad in a battle that's not really anything to do with him. And it could be, and it dives down the inside, but there's going to be contact. There is contact. Nick Foster's like a snooker ball, put into the back pocket. No, he's not. He's in the gravel trap. Sorry. Well, he's travelled on through. He's come out just behind the uh, Pro-Am. And again, Ferrari, that, yeah, of course, and that was, uh, was... That was in reality. It'll be looked at and be deemed whether it was a clean, fair pass or not. But it was Kelvin van der Linde. His patience had expired. Three, two, one. Full course yellow now. Full course yellow. Maybe that's debris on circuit looking for any other sign. We saw that uh, big moment for Nick Foster. And it's debris at turn one, I've been told. So, Oh, we go, we've got the old drill out screwing. So they're going to this. remove the black and yellow yeah. rubber strap. Nick Foster, unfortunately, after that ride and then the runoff through the gravel at turn 16 is down Here in we go. 18th place. Take but a look I mean, at this. This is a really late dive down the inside. And the reality, there was no way Nick Foster didn't expect it. So do you want to hang back and dive into the pit lane? The clock, when it gets to 32, the pit lane will be open. Let's watch the front runners. The first few are going to pass pit lane entry before it is open. They're going through turn 15 now. Have they hung back enough? Looks like Marcello's considering, considering it. He's missed opportunity, so but from fourth place, Bortolotti, who else would have made that no, quick no, dive? That's a great call. That is the call that could see the Grasso Racing Lamborghini take victory here at the end of one hour of racing. An inspired dive into the pits by Mirko Bortolotti. But the Audi is rolling, the Lamborghini is still up on its jacks. What has happened to the Lamborghini pit? It has been a nightmare. Oh. That has thrown all the good work, all the concept of maybe taking victory coming in at the earliest opportunity and it's all been blown. We don't know why on the left-hand side, whether it was the left front or the left rear, I think it might have been the left front, didn't either come off or wouldn't get back on, whatever. Whatever it is, that is something that's the nightmare. Now Christian Engelhardt has lost three places to these three cars directly ahead of it. But that's a very good stop, pit stop once again by the FFF Racing team. So if they can make up positions by doing executing good pit stops, a lot easier than we've seen from finding a way around at a competitive car on a racetrack that doesn't offer up all that many opportunities. And still, the pit stop goes on for the number 90 Mercedes. I mean, I mean, there's something obviously clearly has happened that uh, has a, the number 90 Mercedes. What? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I can't explain it. But so we need to see where that's in April. That in the 88 Mercedes, there it is. In fact, the car that led this race from the lights out. So Vance and April. Look at that pit stop time. One minute 30 38. A. I mean, we were complaining about one minute 13 for a sister car. Um, what went wrong? Um, I don't know. I don't know. So this is our race leader. It went wrong. He crashed out of second place last night. 18-year-old Charles Beard's taken over from Dries Van Tor. Number two on the door. It was number two as its position. But now with the problem for the 88 Acker ASP Mercedes, a big problem has put the, the number two Audi into the lead of the race. It looks so Santelot Racing is in second place now. Yes, Simon Gachet. And then Andrea Caldarelli started sick. Suddenly he's looking at a podium position and he's far from finished. So here's the 88 arriving. What are you doing here? They had to push it back. You can see the tyres aren't ready, so it's an absolute disaster. It's a tall figure of Raffaele Marcello. Get, oh, look at the slamming of the door. Now we've got a, a move. That's Vanson Abril picking his way back up, going past. That's Hiroshi Hamaguchi, not a driver he'd normally be competing against. You normally find Vanson at the front end of the field. We'd explain why with the radio problems. The 88 Acker ASP Mercedes leading the race came in before it was ready. And uh, number 90 seems to be going yeah, slowly. Front right, front, front right, puncture's gone down. That's already just been given a penalty, a uh, warning. Again, that, that was a pit stop. That was a confusion. We didn't see anybody working on the car. And that's picked up. There's oh, the, the wheels car, come up. Well, the, car, the carcass of the tyre has come away. Luckily, he's not a million miles away from pit lane entry. He's got to get the car slowed down. Yesterday, we lost Charles Vietz from second place, running really, really strongly, but he was the top Audi. Then the rest were way down to the, the end of the bottom, the, bottom, uh, the bottom of the top 10, but they're running second, first, second, fifth and sixth and completing the top ten in ten. So much better day for the Audi crews here at Misano. The hotter conditions in the afternoon. Yesterday's race was uh, in the late Se afternoon. Simon Gashi is struggling for traction coming out of turn two. You could see how much 
And Greg held already was able to close down newly really have a look down the inside. I think he's we're going to be almost seeded the position. Team Gashi really just got nothing left in the tank as far as grip is concerned. And that's given Andrea held already the momentum as well as the inspiration to take that lunge down the inside. And it was an unchallenged manoeuvre. Simon Gashi just said, I can't do any more. I'm going to give you a the battle for Silver Cup on is it still Rick Broikers ahead of Nico Bastian. He's really sucked up the pressure, but uh, Bastian is far from finished in the 89 Mercedes. The Mercedes clearly is quicker. This Audi, as we've seen with the um, the third place now, Simon Gashi is struggling. So almost, almost getting to the point of the Mercedes having no track. Now we get up the inside. This time, this time, I think. Has he got it? Yes, yes, yes. Contact, contact, and it's the Audi that almost loses, and it's going to lose another position. Finley Hutchinson's going to probably get through as well. Here, first and second, the gap was 3.2 seconds, went down to 2.8 seconds, being Charles Wurtz in the lead, and Andrea Caldarelli wants it now, 2.6 seconds, 2.594 seconds for Pedden. Simon Gachet, third, Lucas Stoltz, fourth, Finley Hutchinson, fifth, and then this, this battle up into sixth place now, leading the Silver Cup class, the 89 Mercedes from Maca ASP, Nico Bastian. Gaston Martin, Aerovenio in behind. Rick Broikers hasn't given up, but he did get muscled out. And I think it was Taylor Proto just ran over the curbing and beyond out of the final corner. He'd have lost momentum, but he's back on the track. The black and green Audi is in behind in 11th place overall. That's Tom Campbell trying to make progress. Round turn eight for the final time at racing speed up to turn nine and ten. Now, finally, the corners of Evertz's mouth starting to point. Not down, not level. They're starting to point up at the corners out over the curbing, one more corner to negotiate, turn 16, and a new winner, 18 years old, taking victory in the second race at Mizano, Charles Bitz, overjoyed, and imagine the look at the atmosphere in the garage at Team WRT, Dries Van Tor jumping up and down, a win for him, it's not his first at this level, but certainly huge celebrations at WRT, great chase by Andrea Calderelli, came home eventually 2.8 seconds down, in second place overall. He took the win yesterday, so a giant haul of points for Calderelli and Mapelli. Simon Gashi finishing in third place, fourth place Lucas Stoltz. Here comes Finley Hutchinson, great result for the young Scottish driver. And I think you can safely say the celebrations have begun for Team WRT back in winner's circle. Father and son moment. But we're down there with Dries Van Tor and Charles Fiertz. Dries, fantastic, great victory. Could have been one, one yesterday as well. I uh, don't know. Um, well, yesterday was, of course, unfortunate. My knee, he made a rookie mistake. I've also made them in my few years ago. But, you know, he, he came back strong. That's the goal of making a mistake. And uh, you have to learn out of your mistakes and, and come back. And that's what he did. He drove well. And, well, he kept, uh, he kept the line behind. He was coming quickly. They have been, they've been strong the weekend. But uh, we've kept him behind for this race. So let's go to the next one. Excellent. Charles, we're trying to get hold of Charles Vertz. Come here, come here. Let's tell us about your drive, Charles. That was fantastic. Well, it was not easy, especially in this warm. At the end, yeah, the 563 was was really pushing to, to catch us. But yeah, I think a lot of work has been done in the pits with these guys who just did an amazing, amazing job putting us in front of the 88. Um, I don't know what happened to the 88, but at the end we won the race and yeah, I'm so, so happy. I'm really pleased. Let's take a look at the results. Victory there, there's the proof. The number two Audi winning by just under three seconds. Charles Wiertz bringing home after Dries Van Tor did the hard work in the early part of the race. Andrea Caldarelli, Marco Bapelli, first yesterday, second today, huge haul of points. Simon Gastri, Christopher Haas, third, just holding off Lucas Stoltz, who finished uh, having taken over from Mario Engel, but more useful points for the championship's leaders. They're still there, but it's really closing in. Finley Hutchinson will be delighted with that fifth place. The Scottish driver really picking it up the order. Finished uh, one position ahead of the top car in the Silver Cup class, driven home by Nico Bastian, the lead class, lead car in the Pro-Am class. Top of the table there, number 16th position overall, 48 seconds down, but Renat Salikov bringing that home to take victory. One position ahead of Hiroshi Hamaguchi, who was second in the class. The trophy's coming out for Santelot Racing for third place. That's for Christopher Haza and Simon Gachet. Second place trophies to add to their winning trophies from last night. Came up from sixth on the grid. Marco Mapelli started, Andrea Caldarelli led the chase to the finish, but just couldn't quite catch and pass the number two Audi. Started by Dries Van Tor and finished in some considerable style.
Stefan Rattel out to present the checks and a new set of hands. That is goodbye from us here at Mizano. Two very hot days, huge amount of fabulous racing. Enjoyed it enormously. Can't wait for the next one. We will be at Sandport.